I think the problem statement is the single hardest thing we will ever write in our lives. Who would have thought, you know, 250 words would become the thing you may spend months writing. You're listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing clarity to the often mysterious doctoral process. Do you feel like you're losing your mind? Let me and my guests show you how to put more joy in your journey and graduate with your sanity, health, and relationships intact. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Frederick, and this is episode 14. Have you heard the phrase, the best dissertation is a done dissertation? Well, in this episode, I speak with Dr. Melanie Shaw about the one thing that gets so many students stuck, aligning your topic with your problem statement, with your purpose, and your research questions. Listen in and learn how to create a strong foundation for your research so you can be done. Dr. Melanie Shaw has her PhD in education and has spent the past two decades teaching and serving as an administrator in online higher education settings. She serves as an adjunct faculty at several institutions and facilitates webinars for the Online Learning Consortium. In addition to her teaching roles, she trains faculty to develop and deliver courses online, conducts research on topics related to non-traditional education, and is involved in strategic leadership relative to the vision for online education. Now, what Melanie didn't include in her bio that she sent to me was that she is known for getting students who are stuck at the dissertation writing stage unstuck. And so what better person to have on today's show as we delve into this issue of alignment, which is a sticking point for most, if not all students at some point during their writing. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you so much for having me, Heather. What a pleasure to be able to be here and share some hopefully useful ideas that will help those students who are listening in get unstuck in their own writing process. I recently attended a training where you talked about alignment. And what I loved was that you backed up and you started with the topic and you brought up this idea of what happens sometimes when a student starts with or leads with a professional or personal interest rather than the research driving the process. And you have a two-step process that helps hone the topic for the student. We always want to start with the recent peer-reviewed literature. I like to tell my students that they don't have to reinvent the wheel. They don't have to come up with an idea out of just the pure air. The researchers who are writing on the topics that we're passionate about have done the legwork for us. In every peer-reviewed article, there's going to be a section where the authors talk about future research needs that emerge, that are gaps. Every study not only answers some questions, but it also brings up unanswered questions that need to be further probed. So what I have my students do is start with the peer reviewed literature from the past six months even, and then to find in those articles, the places where the authors are making recommendations about future research needs. The studies are there, we've got the breadcrumb trails. So take your interests, your topic interests, use keywords from those topics to go find five peer-reviewed studies. So Melanie, I wanna stop you there because I think that's a really important point. People can go down a bunny trail, yes, but <laughs> kind of fall into this black hole, this abyss. You're saying five, five. find five. Five, it doesn't have to be an exhaustive review. It's just a sampling, but do look at those recent studies. Don't go back 10 years because it's very possible that those older ideas have already been fleshed out, have already been explored. So we want to go with the most current literature around our topic interests and find out what those breadcrumb trails are. These will be sentences that say something like, this research provided evidence about this, but 
what we still don't know, or while yeah. now we have an idea of this relationship between the variables, future research should. And this is in fact how I came up with my dissertation idea. The people who are already doing research in my area of interest were saying, hey guys, this is a missing puzzle piece. Who wants to help find it? That's it. That's exactly right. And then from those ideas, you know, let's say that the author says, while we looked at this from a quantitative lens, it would be helpful to know the lived experiences of the people who've been through this. Boom, you've got an interesting phenomenological study that you might pursue around that. The other benefit of grounding your topic ideas in the literature this way is that you're already starting to amass literature for your literature review. You're gonna be able to use these foundational studies that you found to support your research problem, research purpose, your research questions. And all of a sudden we're beginning this alignment idea that you brought up at the beginning. And the second thing you have them do is come up with a very short description. In fact, you have a very specific number of words. Yes. Let's talk about that. Yes. So one of the things that we misinterpret about doctoral research is we think it needs to be so cerebral and so dense. And sometimes it can read that way, but truly the most elegant research is stated in simple words. So what I challenge my students to do is to write a six word sentence that sort of captures this topic. And I will even have them frame that sentence as a question. And that question can become sort of the overarching question that's used to guide the whole study. In sort of generating that very short six word sentence, you have to think what isn't known? What are these researchers who I'm reading are saying isn't known about this topic? And then what doesn't the student know? A trap that a lot of students fall into is they set out to do research where they think they know something and they want to use their research to prove what they know. That's not research. Research is about exploring something no one knows and finding a potential solution to that. Now, some of the best research doesn't ultimately solve the problem, but it chips away at it. In a recent example, we can look at, at the COVID-19 vaccine. There were lots of attempts at that early on that have been shelved. They didn't work. But yet through continuous iterative progress and the amassing of knowledge that happens in a synthesizing way around a research topic, we can begin to parse and pull apart these problems. So what isn't known? What don't you as the researcher know, and then how do you know that you don't know? So it's about building this evidence around this gap in knowledge that exists. Six words that derive from the recent peer-reviewed articles around a topic is going to help you find the, the ether of your topic that can take you all the way through. And what I loved is this idea that it's actually a diagnostic tool if you can't say what it is that you're interested in studying in six words, there's something happening here yes. that don't go forward. Right. <laughs> don't move forward until you can come up with these six words. That's exactly right. We need to be able to articulate in language that even an elementary school student could understand what our top of interest is. If we can't do that, it's too dense. It's overly convoluted and will make for messy research. Now, hopefully if you're listening, this may sound freeing and liberating. Instead of coming up with this highly complex paragraph, we really want to know as your committee in about six words, what is your topic? So just start there, right? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Now, once you have that, we move on to the problem statement. And this is something that's very short. You and I both prefer 250 word-ish, maybe even a paragraph if you can do it. But boy, can it take a long time to create. Yes. I think the problem statement is the single hardest thing we will ever write in our lives. 
<laughs> Who would have thought, you know, 250 words would become the thing you may spend months writing. Let's pause there because you just said this paragraph may take months. Yes. Yes, that can be a disheartening thing to think about, but truly, if you think about the problem statement as the cornerstone of your whole study, all of a sudden you can see the worthiness of investing this kind of time on this single chunk, this tiny little paragraph that will support the whole 200 pages or however your overall study, however long that becomes. So don't feel like you're alone if it's taking you a while to craft this problem statement that your committee approves. You've got three questions that you have your students answer that leads to this cornerstone, a solid, solid foundation. Let's go through those questions. Yes. What is the problem as documented in the literature? Now, remember when we were talking about how do you find this topic, this is the literature you're citing here. So what have the authors that you've been reading captured as the very specific narrow problem? Second question, whose problem is it? Now the answer to this question is going to help you begin to narrow in on the population you will use for your study. And the final question is, what happens if the problem isn't solved? I think one of the most common hiccups that happens in the writing of a problem statement is that a student will conflate it with a purpose statement. Instead of focusing on the bad things that are happening around this problem, they focus on what they'd like to do with their research. I like to tell my students to imagine horror music playing in the background when they read through their problem statement. That horror music should be a fitting backdrop for the bad, awful things that are happening around the problem. So imagine the Jaws theme. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. That sense of ominousness needs to be captured in the problem statement. Leave me with a cliffhanger. So this is the soundtrack, this ominous horror type music for your problem statement. So let's give an example. And we see this, you and I see this all the time, the mixing of the problem and the purpose, which is what we mean by you don't have alignment. That's one indication. There's yes. lots of different ways you can have misalignment. But one example would be something like, the problem is we need to know more about. That is not a problem. That's that not a problem. <laughs> So get out your problem statement if you guys are working on it. And if you're saying the problem is we don't know enough ab about something, that's not going to yeah. pass. Or we want to understand something. Or doing this thing results in improvements in XYZ. That's not a problem. Improvements are good. Solutions are good. Problems are things like school counselors can't provide career services because of the absence of students during virtual learning as a result of the pandemic. Career services are important for students. They're not getting them because of some change, some thing that's occurred. Bad things happen. Students won't be prepared for their college admissions. They won't get vocational guidance. And you can test yourself here by completing a sentence, right? The problem is blank which results in blank. Yes. Kind yes. of brings me back to those old school ad libs, right? Fill in the blank. <laughs> right. <laughs> It'll help get you back on track. Let's say we've got this problem. We've got this nice, tight, clear, concise paragraph that when we read it out loud, some sort of Jaws-like music is appropriate. We can hear that as a soundtrack. Then we're going to layer on the purpose and you use this analogy of Lego bricks. It should be a logical next step. Yes, let's use our school counseling problem. So if we've got school counselors who are unable to provide those career planning services as a result of the pandemic, the purpose will be to find strategies that school counselors can use to provide career planning services during the pandemic. Do you hear how the words in the problem mirror the words in the purpose? They're really about living out the solution. 
to the problem. The purpose of our study will be to solve that problem or to test a solution. Again, sometimes the things we test end up not meeting out and that's okay. Research that doesn't come to a conclusive end still can be valid and, and important in helping us think holistically about problems. But we want to try out something that can solve that problem, that can resolve that cliffhanger issue with that Jaws music playing in the background. So if we want to give kind of this fill in the blank for the purpose, we could say the purpose of this fill in the blank, your type of study is to, and this should be a logical response to the problem. You mentioned those same words should appear. I think one of the pitfalls I see is people think they can't be redundant or they need to get creative in their writing. And then that is another way you start to lose alignment because you've got to use the same words. You can't use motivation in your problem and then switch to influence, for example, in your purpose. Keep the same word. That's it. And, and it, that redundancy is important. We might even call that redundancy alignment. <laughs> Yes. And you suggest getting out a highlighter even. I do. I do. When you have written a well-crafted, pithy problem statement, you will have keywords. Those keywords should be easily highlighted. In our example, we've got career planning, right? That would be a keyword that we would be highlighting. School counselors, pandemic. These are the key ideas that are emerging as a result. Those same words that are highlighted or highlightable should be appearing in not only the purpose, but also the next Lego brick that gets built, which is the research questions that emerge from that purpose. The research questions to which the answers give us the solution potential solution, because we've got to do the research to find out if it actually works, but the potential solution to that problem. All of those highlighted keywords should appear in the problem statement, the purpose statement, and the research questions. There should be no surprises. If there are extraneous words in the research questions that don't appear in the problem statement, we don't have alignment. Same with the purpose statement. If you've got words that are appearing new that you can't highlight in all three, you know that you've gone off track with alignment. And you know, Melanie, one of the strategies I use when I'm reviewing, I just reviewed five proposals this week. All of them had varying levels of misalignment. I actually start with the research questions because the research questions it. tend to be clear and concise, right? Yeah. And yeah. I myself will highlight what I think are the variables or the constructs. And then I go backwards and I see, is this where the focus is with the problem and the purpose? And lo and behold, five times out of five this last week, somewhere there was this misalignment. It happens. And I think it can be helpful for the student to know while you're building these things sequentially, you're starting with the problem statement. That's your corner. So from there comes the purpose statement. You can't write a purpose statement without a problem statement. You can't write your research questions without a purpose statement and a problem statement in order to ensure this alignment. But as faculty, as your committee, we may very well be looking at it in the inverse order to see if we can trace the threads of that alignment through those important three foundational pieces. These three pieces are the foundation of your house that is your research study. So it might feel like you're going slow, right? As you write this, what seems like such a small proportion of your overall document, but you say go slow to go fast. Go slow to go fast. In fact, when my students have spent months and months honing these three pieces that may total a page and a half, all together, after they've gotten that beautifully aligned, I cut them loose to write the rest of chapter one because the heavy lifting is done at that point. Once you've got a well-aligned research idea, you can frame out the rest of the chapter that is going to be the introduction to your study and capture all of the pieces like the background of the problem. What are the things that led us 
to the current context where our Jaws music is playing. All of those pieces can be so much more easily fleshed out once you've done the heavy lifting, sweat, equity work of building an aligned problem, purpose, and research question. Now, often what we see is there is something that happens where a student might get stuck in what feels like this loop of the chair of the committee saying, you still don't have alignment, you still don't have alignment. And a technique that you and I both use is simply getting the student on the phone or a Zoom call because often you can articulate what it is you want to do, but there's just something happening between getting that idea out of your head and onto that piece of paper. That's exactly right. We know that each of us brings to this work our own learning preferences and our own learning skills. Sometimes it's easier to verbally articulate a thing and actually dialogue back and forth. Your chairperson in particular is your partner on this journey and you should use every means of communication possible. And that includes picking up the phone or jumping on a Zoom conference with your chair to work through these early critical pieces. Sometimes simply speaking aloud your ideas can very quickly allow for a triage of where you may be going off point. For example, if you're capturing your idea of the problem as a purpose, your chair can say, but wait, effective learning strategies isn't a problem. What do you mean? How is it a problem? What are you seeing in the literature that leads us to believe there's something that must be solved urgently? So yes, pick up the phone, have a conversation, allow for those multimodal ways of expressing so that you can begin to really understand whether it's written or verbally articulated, or even drawn out. Sometimes students really like concept mapping and creating a concept map of this problem purpose research questions can help you visualize where that misalignment may be occurring. I will often say we can either go back and forth with about 10 to 20 iterations of this paragraph, or we can get on a 10 minute phone call because that's where we ask, say it in one sentence. Yes right? And you and I both use this alignment worksheet that we can't trace back. (laughs) We're not sure where it came from. Um, The brilliant sage who developed this tool. (laughs) Years ago, it was a student, in fact, at a residency who said, someone gave this to me and I found it very helpful. I have since modified it. I've shared it with other faculty who have modified it. And it has become this kind of living, breathing document. And we call it the alignment worksheet, where it brings you through everything we just talked about. And you literally fill in the blank. That's exactly right. It is the formula for, in one sentence, what is the problem? In one sentence, what is the purpose? You're going to find those same highlighted words. One's going to fulfill the other. So it it gives you a very simplified way of capturing the essence of these critical foundational bricks, these Legos that will become the beautiful fortress of your research. And what I love about it is because it is on just about one page, I will say, print it out, go old school, right? Because I'm a big fan of actually putting pen to paper, print out a couple of copies and play with it and come up with two, three, four, five. And one of those probably is going to meet alignment. So instead of sitting down at this computer screen with track changes and comments from your committee, print out this one pager, get out a pencil and draft out some potential ideas here. And it really seems to work through a block that people can have when they're trying to get alignment. That's exactly right. I think um, another thing Sometimes students really struggle with narrowing down the topic. There may be several research ideas they're interested in. Print off one of these alignment worksheets for each of your ideas and flesh them out. And then have that conversation with your chair where you say, well, I've thought about this or this. And then you can begin to talk about which of these is more feasible 
which of these should be a, a simpler study to execute overall. So absolutely, because it is such a, a, a short abbreviated document, it gives you a chance to sort of tickle the ideas out before investing too heavily months and months in your problem statement, purpose statement, research questions. So Melanie, you said you could get together with your chair and pick the one that was more doable. You even use the word simple. I yeah. think there is absolutely this idea out there that your dissertation has to be super complex and solve the problem. And I want you to talk a little bit more about this because every time I see you at a residency, you have a sentence that you say to <laughs> students over and over and over again. And what is that sentence? Yes, the best dissertation is a finished dissertation. And, and I, again, don't know the etiology of that saying, but thank you to whomever came up with that idea because we simply cannot save the world with our doctoral research. We can't. And those of us who have careers in research know that we may spend a lifetime drilling down on a particular little pain point that we want so badly to address. It can take our whole life to even begin to unearth some of the pieces of the solution of those pain points. So don't let your dissertation become so bogged down in what you perceive to be the importance, the gravitas of it, that you can't get to a finished product. This is your first research endeavor. It's not your last. So don't make it your magnum opus. In fact, in chapter five or whatever that concluding chapter is in your school's format, there's going to be a place for you to talk about those additional research ideas that you were just dying to solve. There is a space for that future research, just like you went to those peer reviewed articles to find your topic and find what those authors were saying was needed gaps that needed to be filled. You get to do this in your own research. So save those ideas of saving the world for chapter five, where you can make those recommendations. And who knows, maybe it becomes your life's work but it's not the work of your doctoral dissertation. That is to be finished in as clear and as simple and as doable a time frame as possible. The best dissertation is a finished dissertation. Say it to yourself all the time. One of the things that happens is there's little deaths along the way of a journey, deaths of our dreams about the importance of what we're doing, deaths about the way we wanted to do a thing that we really cared about, but it simply doesn't work for whatever reason. Allow those deaths to happen, embrace them as part of the journey, because ultimately your committee is working over time to help you get to the finish line. That should be your goal too. And using that one page worksheet is again, a great diagnostic tool. If you can't answer the questions in one sentence, you've probably got a scope that's a little broad. Too big too big and nobody needs to write a 700 page dissertation. You just don't need to do it. You'll thank us later if you keep it simple. <laughs> well, Melanie, thank you so much for walking us through from topic to problem statement to purpose to research questions, how to get alignment. We will have the alignment worksheet that we were talking about available as a link in these show notes. So before we sign off, do you have um, any final words of wisdom or maybe an inspiring quote that you would like to share? You know, I think my biggest thing is that you are doing the important work of furthering the scholarship in your field. It's an admirable goal. It's completable. It is finishable. Tenacity is the name of the game. You listening here to the wisdom of Dr. Heather Frederick is going to inch you that much closer to your goal. Thank you so much for having me be a part of this. It's very special to me. Thanks for your time, Melanie. And I hope to have you back real soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. If you're enjoying the Happy Doc Student Podcast, could I ask you a big favor? Would you be willing to rate, review, and subscribe? It would help me get noticed by more people like you, people who know there is a better way to navigate the doctoral process. 
Oh, and hey, before I sign off, I do need to remind you, the information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. 